thanks to the people who've arranged our book talks um, in the past, and uh, their members of our library staff and administration. I want to acknowledge um, Nicholas Mianelli, who's here, who's the head of library programming. He's done all our book talks this year. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And um, I also want to acknowledge um, Pam Rents and uh, Shanna Jackson from uh, library administration uh, for supporting the book talk. So thank you. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to have this discussion about uh, Professor Tai Su Sang's book, and it's the ideological foundations of chain taxation, belief systems, politics, and institutions. And um, I'm sure everyone in the room knows uh, Professor Zhang, but this is uh, uh, a book talk that's going to be uh, posted on our YouTube channel, and we definitely have a lot of viewers from all over the world. So I will introduce him very briefly. Uh, Professor Zhang is a professor of law at Yale Law School. He works on comparative legal and economic history, private law theory, and contemporary Chinese law and politics. He's also the author of The Laws and Economics of Confucianism, Kingship, and Property in Pre-Industrial China and England. That was a mouthful, and I don't think I've got everything. But um, we have a moderator. We have a facilitator this afternoon. So I'm pleased also, and everybody knows uh, Professor Moyne, but I'm going to introduce him briefly. Uh, professor Samuel Moyne is Chancellor Kent Professor of Law and History here at Yale University, and he is going to facilitate this uh, fascinating, I predict, discussion with uh, Professor Zan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Femi. It's, uh, it's really uh, a celebratory occasion above all, uh, and it's a privilege for me to have this role, which is to ask Taisu a few questions before I get out of the way uh, in view of the no doubt greater expertise uh, on the topic out there. And so we'll chat for a while, and then you'll get a chance to ask a few questions about this really splendid book, uh, which I've now uh, had uh, the luck to read a couple of times, once in preparation for a podcast, uh, which we did, and once in preparation for today. Uh, and it's growing on me. Uh, so uh, let's begin uh, by uh, letting Tai Su just take five or ten minutes to give us an overview of the project and what it achieves. Um, thank you, Sam, and thank you, Femi, for the introduction. Um, so I gotta say, like, it's the fact that the book can grow on Sam is perhaps the greatest praise it could possibly actually receive, and I'm extremely happy that it actually is growing on Sam. Um, so the book basically tries to explain one core historical phenomenon, which is um, the somewhat microscopic size of the late imperial Chinese fiscal state. Um, the Conventional view of basically imperial China is that imperial China is a, you know, still to this day. If you read people like Duran Asimoglu and James Robinson and a whole host of other economists, economists who write about the subject, they'll still tell you, like, you know, late imperial China is a despotic power that oppressed its peoples and in, in which the state held unchecked power and played a largely exploitative, extractive, and oppressive role um, across all of society. Um, so the, the, the starting point of the book is that that's all wrong. Uh, in fact, if actually, no, no matter how you compare it, whether you compare it horizontally or vertically, the later imperial Chinese state, especially the Qing dynasty state, um, was an extraordinarily limited state. It was a state of basically kind of, a, kind of like a small state ideology and had arguably the smallest level, like the lowest level of taxes that to this day I have ever seen in a major regime across any point in human history. Uh, to give you some rough comparisons, so across the early modern world, regimes fall pretty much into three basic types. There are what you might call uh, Eurasian empires, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire. These are large, expansive land-based empires uh, that warded out um, for influence across um, pretty much central Eurasia. Then there are what you might call kind of you know, like smaller, mid-sized, but nonetheless land-based European states. Uh, and these would be something like France and various versions of you know, the Habsburgs or uh, Prussia and so on and so forth. Um, then you have what you might call island, like smaller, more consolidated island countries, England, Japan. 
And across these, the tax rates vary. The larger you get, the, ta the lower the taxes are. So you get England and Japan, England and Japan on the higher side of things were uh, even around like 1700, their annual taxes were something like 20% of GDP. Um, but if you go down to mid-sized European countries like France, you go down to the seven to 10% range. And by the time you get to like large land-based Eurasian empires, you're pretty much around the 5% uh, range. Now, China, prior to the Qing Dynasty, this final imperial dynasty, which started in 1644 and ended in uh, 1912, um, prior to this dynasty, China pretty much behaved like your normal Eurasian empire. Um, it taxed in the Tang and Ming dynasties around 5 to 7%. The Song was an outlier in some ways because it had greater geopolitical threats. It went up to around the 10% range in how much it taxed. The Qing compared whether to those dynasties or to its early modern Eurasian peers was extremely low. Uh, by, by our best estimates, by around 1800, or certainly by 1840, um, our best estimates of how much the Qing state actually taxed as a share of annual GDP was probably in the 1% to 2% range, more edging towards the 1% range. Now, the difference between a 1% tax rate and even a 5% tax rate is enormous in terms of uh, state, capacity, state capacity, how much you actually control society, uh, and how much you know, military power you have, how much spending power you have. So across all these dimensions, the Qing state is an, is an incredibly limited state um, that for the most part of its latter half, um, wielded almost no direct control, um, coercive control, over most of its local communities. So the book tries to explain how this came to be. And just very briefly, so that we can start the conversation, the previous explanations are mainly what you might call economic explanations. These are explanations given by economists uh, running on various versions of political economy. Um, they basically argue either that the Qing state had no demand for high taxes, or it had a inability of t uh, some kind of inability to supply high taxes because it, it lacked the administrative firepower, or lacked the social consensus to actually produce this kind of thing. Uh, alternatively, there is a theory that's more, more recent that basically says, uh, this is championed, for example, by, by my friend Yu Hua Wang at, at Harvard, uh, who teaches in the politics department, um, who argues that basically it's the self-interest self of elites that prevents the state from, from increasing taxes, and the, the, the defining characteristic of China in the second millennium is that society becomes decentralized and local elites gain more power vis-a-vis -vis the center. Now, that's something that begs, um, begs explanation on its own, but he says that this is the main source of low taxes, of taxes getting continuously lower from the Song to the Ming to the Tim. Now, I basically try to argue against all of these, and I say that you can't really explain any of this um, Qing fiscal, um, you, you can't explain the core facets of this like, Qing fiscal self-restraint by recourse to rationalist political economy models. Instead, you have to basically look towards softer factors. Uh, particularly, you have to look towards the ideology of the political elites of the Qing. And the way that this, the argument runs is, lest we get into like another 20 minutes of this, just quick summaries. Um, but the argument is that the Qing elites had a very rigid worldview in which they really believed in two things. One was that um, you know, taxing is, is basically morally problematic, but they share this belief with pretty much all previous dynasties. They never managed to stop previous dynasties from taxing at relatively higher rates when they needed to. But by the same, they also continue to believe that there's something morally wrong um, with taxation per se. This is an like old Confucian belief. But what was different in the Qing um, was that that normative belief had become merged with an empirical narrative that basically was produced by Ming collapse, by the previous dynasty's collapse, uh, in the sense that, that that collapse produced the empirical narrative that, 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 that the Ming dynasty collapsed because of overly high taxes. And therefore, you can identify based on the Ming example a, a certain kind of fiscal red line um, of around pretty much 30, um, 30 million tails of silver per year that you can charge to the rural peasantry. And once you charge anything beyond that, as they did in the late Ming, the peasantry are likely going to rise up and pretty much kill you. So if you want to avoid massive peasant rebellions that can fundamentally kill off the dynasty, you should never step beyond that empirical red line of somewhere around 30 million tails of rural taxation. And so the, 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 ar the core argument of the book is that you know, moral arguments themselves don't impose much of a really strong constraint on political behavior. We all know politicians who, frankly, even if they actually genuinely hold moral beliefs, when push comes to shove, they need the money or it's really strongly in their political interests to step beyond their moral boundaries, usually they're going to do that. 
it's when the moral beliefs become merged um, with a certain kind of empirical worldview that dramatically enhances and reinforces the, mor the, mor the moral worldview. That's when these things form into what you might call a full-blown mature ideology. And the ideology becomes politically weaponized. It becomes hugely politically restrictive because simply speaking, saying something is morally wrong might not stop you, but saying something is morally wrong and doing it is going to kill you is a much more powerful political message. And so that was the kind of political message that was produced by Qing elites uh, in the aftermath of the Ming collapse. Right? That was the core lesson they learned um, from the perceived failures of Ming collapse. Now, the second part of the, 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 the explanation is, well, you, know, you, you have an initial shock. The shock is huge and traumatic. It kills off a third of the population. It's you know, gigantically disruptive. But even that larger shock can't last for 250 years, which is pretty much the longevity of this fiscal ideology of conservatism. Now, what explains the longevity? And there, the answer basically is that because this is a fundamentally empirical worldview, it has to largely, you know, if, you, if you're going to ditch it, if you're going to throw it away and replace it with a more expansionist worldview that permits you to, to raise taxes, you have to do so on empirical grounds and not just on moral grounds. Now, the, the most distinctive thing about Qing administration was that starting from around 1680 onwards, um, this is the only Chinese dynasty in, I think, recorded history to never do a land survey. Now, land surveys are the main vehicle that the state produces authoritative information about the overall size of the rural economy, right? This is the modern equivalent of the state doing GDP surveys and producing GDP figures. The, every single dynasty before the Qing does land surveys to constantly update its understanding of how much land there is, how much production there is, how much population can you actually sustain based on your production levels. Um, the Qing is the only dynasty to swear off doing land surveys. It swears it off because it has this certain kind of like fearful logic that, okay, the peasants know that the only reason we ever do land surveys is that we do land service that we know whether we can raise taxes. If we're really going to commit to the peasantry, that we're never going to raise taxes beyond this red line, then the best way to make a credible commitment to that effect is actually to swear off land survey. Right, like by killing off the possibility of land surveying, we're also making a fully credible commitment to the peasantry that we're never really going to try to raise taxes on you. And they will trust us, they will uh, abide by our rule, and they're not going to try to rise up and kill us all. But the thing is, without land surveying, the Qing perception of how much production capacity was in the overall Qing economy was pretty much locked in from 1680 onwards. Now, once you lock that in, you basically can't update your understanding of the economy to permit yourself to raise further taxes. And that's what pretty much happens, right? Like if you, if you look at Qing political dialogue, even in the 1780s, they're still citing like 1640 land data as if it were still accurate and authoritative. At the same time, because they no longer tax on the basis of, of population, they do survey the population, right? And they know their population is growing. So in their minds, right, they, they're dealing with a gigantic Malthusian crisis of enormous proportions. Their population is growing pretty rapidly, but the overall ability of the rural economy to feed that population actually is declining, or at least stagnating. Now, this is a Malthusian crisis, which means that whatever your ability to tax was before, probably right now it's even lower. So whatever you do, you certainly can't raise taxes. Um, in fact, like the, the, the presumption against raising taxes gets so strong that by like 1800, anyone who even proposes a tax increase gets automatically punished and demoted. So in that kind of overall atmosphere, this ideology that was produced in the aftermath of the Ming collapse shock um, gets kind of institutionally reinforced all the way through the end of the Qing when various external circumstances finally conspired to force the Qing to drop the uh, presumption of, low to, uh, of like locking in taxation. Now, the interesting thing is once the, the, in the final decade of the dynasty, the, the state is forced by these pressures to finally experiment with, 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 that, with tax increases, it actually begins to realize we actually have more room to tax than we thought we actually did. And so even after the dynasty collapsed in 1911, that's the lesson that every successor regime going into Republican China and PRC China learns from these like late Qing tax increases. Actually, the Qing misled itself into believing it had no room to increase taxes but in fact, looking at this like 1907 attempt to raise taxes, which was successful for the most part, 
we actually can raise taxes. So every other successor regime keeps raising taxes on the rural peasantry until the tax rate goes from like 1% in 1900 to 3 to 5% in the 1920s and 30s. And then by the communist era in the 1950s, it's pretty much at 10%. So the tax rate basically goes to 1,000% of what it used to be. And surprise, surprise, the peasantry can actually still afford to pay the taxes just because the previous Qing level was so unbelievably low. So essentially only the, sh the late Qing kind of crises that the government faces manages to force them out of this um, stagnation of taxes. And from then on, this Chinese state goes from this low taxation, small state ideology into a full-blown status ideology where basically they think actually the main problem with the Qing um, was that the state was too small. And instead, we have to learn that lesson and then fully commit to a kind of like a statist ex expansionist model. And so hence, you have from that point onwards, across the entire 20th century into the 21st century, the Chinese state constantly committing itself uh, to governmental expansion, governmental control, various, for, uh, various versions of state interference with the market. And to, to a very large extent, this entire commitment towards statism has roots in the new ideology of statism that they learned from the example of Qing decline and eventual collapse. So by 1911, you come full circle, right? The Qing gets itself into a small state fiscal conservative, um, uh, fiscally conservative ideology based on what it perceived to be the lessons of Ming collapse. And then it's l l later regimes then learn from the example of Qing collapse that actually that was incorrect. And we have to raise taxes pretty aggressively. So by this point, China is, one of, is certainly one of the larger fiscal states uh, in the world. And again, that has a lot to do with the example set by uh, the, what they perceive to be the lessons of the late Qing. All right, so I'm going to stop there, and we're going to, I guess, talk. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just ask if, you know, throw a few questions out and uh, well, one at a time, and you can answer them or just disregard them, and I'll try another one, and then we'll uh, turn right. it out to the crowd. So. Um, tai Su's beef with the the you know Chinese rulers for those centuries is that they failed to tax the peasantry adequately. Yes, uh, <laughs> and and I put it in those moral terms because it's you know as you just heard very very social scientific, but lurking I think is a if I may say is a a nationalist concern um, about the failure of China to launch. Uh, and I just want to invite you to begin with to talk about why one would frame the problem that way. I mean, there, there were a lot of comparative references already in, in just trying to think about, you know, a, a, the credible level of taxation. Yeah. And of course, we know, as you just said, looking forward uh, into the 20th century that more was possible just even within this region of the world. But as, as an ignorant Orientalist, I just would have assumed that um, everywhere in the world, people are languishing in poverty and despotism. Uh, and okay, there are different states that tax more or less, but there's, there, the outlying state is England in the first instance, yep. uh, and later other European states starting in 1750-ish yep. that do something different yes. than all the other regimes in world history and launch. And then I, I, I'm confused why we wouldn't kind of look at England and determine why it did launch when everyone else didn't uh, and then f kind of measure si similarity and difference. Right. This is the great divergence debate, which yeah. to which this book is highly relevant. But I just assumed there would be a number of factors on the list, the kind of state, what it's doing uh, in, ver in various ways, what its features are internally. Why obsess, if, if I can put it that way, about taxation when the list is likely to be long when we start with England as as the outlier or the leading you know the leading state that transforms the world through uh, first just copycat activity and then imperialism and so forth oh, great so, so the, the, this is uh, it, um, Sam speaking to the underlying kind of like gorilla in the 
book, which is the book is really trying an attempt to eventually, perhaps in the third book, get at the question of why China fell behind the West. Uh, one of my personal pet explanations is that it was largely because of low state capacity. Uh, and once you actually fix low state capacity in the 20th century, China eventually begins to take off. Now, as Sam points out correctly, th that is only one factor in a pretty complicated range of possibilities that can explain, say, Sino-English divergence. Um, but to properly frame the question, right? So the the rise of the West in the 19th century is one of those one of those things that has at least like 17 different ways of framing it. You can you can frame it as why did England pull ahead of everybody else? You can also frame it in, for each individual country that didn't match England, blow by blow, um, as to why that country fell behind. And you're going to find that very likely the explanations for why some individual country fell behind are going to be different from why England pulled ahead, right? Because England's the first mover. It, 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 like, by logical necessity, it probably had to have the best combination of various factors for modern economic growth or modern regime change and political um, development and so on and so forth. So if you, if you imagine modern economic slash political development as driven by, let's just say, like a collection of 20 different factors, right? Then the likelihood that the first, there's a likelihood the first mover has pretty much all 20 of those factors, or at least like a close to like a majority of them. So England would probably be superior to most other regimes in like a, a number of these factors. And so looking just at England, you can point to all kinds of things. Um, it's geographical isolation, it's coal supplies, it's form of government, it's social institutions, um, the level of control that the gentry had over the peasantry, it's commercialization, it's empires, it's colonies, all kinds of things, right? Everyone's pointed to all of these things. But what England had is not the same question as what the other countries lacked, right? And the thing is, of all those 20 factors, it could well be that different countries lack different factors, right? France might have lacked like a more robust trade regime. Japan might have lacked, I don't know, like a more bureaucratic form of government or whatever. Now, the question, so every, like, if you need all 20, then if presumably all you, like, all it takes for you to not match England is missing one of these things. And it's perfectly, perfectly possible that 20 countries would have 20 different explanations for why they're behind England. And so in, in this case, like the, frame, the part of the framing of the book, the reason why it's China focused is it's, this is not so much an explanation of why England was first, but rather why China was so far behind, not just behind England, but also behind France, Germany, uh, Japan eventually. Japan is the second most salient comparison in this book. And there, what, you've, what you find is that China had a lot of the things that we usually attribute to that, that, that we usually you know, think of as major reasons for English success. It had markets, pr private property, pretty rationalized bureaucracy, um, credible commitments by the state to not interfere with the private economy. It had you know, robust social institutions, relatively high levels of trust, depending on the region and so on and so forth. And also, you know, it was such a large cross-regional um, economy that you don't even have to talk about like why China as a whole didn't industrialize. You can just look at the richest parts, and the richest parts are the size of France, right? So there are a lot of things going for, especially the, the richest parts of the Chinese economy. The thing that I think was missing was capital culmination, right? Like. China has a lot of other things. It didn't have large amounts of capital accumulation. Now, you can, you can get capital, capital accumulation through one of two ways. Either you have lots of wealth inequality. And for whatever reason, China didn't really have that either. That's explained by the, in my first book. And the second thing is you have to have this, either that or you have to have the state accumulate a lot, a lot of wealth. This was the kind of Japanese-German model that you saw take off pretty powerfully in the 19th century. So either way, right, the, you, you ask the question, like you ask the moral question of why did I, like, I, I guess the unspoken moral accusation is, why are you calling for screwing the peasantry even more? Or like, why are you not concerned with like letting the like just letting the peasantry live better, like with these lower taxes? And the thing is, yeah, you would be concerned about that, but I'm also concerned with the country basically falling behind in such a way that it becomes subject to colonial attempts, invasions, military defeats, regime collapse, and so on and so forth. And if, you're, if you want to avoid those things, then keeping up in the overall kind of grand game of industrial military races does matter a lot. And on that ground, the lack of capital accumulation, which perhaps by definition requires screwing the little guy a little bit, 
was perhaps the single most important thing that was lacking in China. So in a certain kind of bizarre way, China might have been treating its peasantry better than almost any other peasantry was treated at that point in time. But ironically, that was over the long run a considerable failure of the state's responsibility to the general population as well. Well, it, I guess it would depend on what the state's responsibility is. But I, I hear you as, as conceding in a sense that even remedying this defect, had the state uh, taxed the peasantry three or four times as much, wouldn't necessarily have launched the, the country in this great game of, of success and power, but it, it was on the list and deserved attention just like something else was in your first book and something else in your second. So I want to then turn to a second question because one reason, you know, potentially not to screw the peasantry in your phrase would be that your religion, uh, your local religion says wealth is not worth pursuing. Uh, but uh, what's curious is, in your account at least, what happens to Confucianism in this period, at least for these ruling elites, which is, in your, in your view, Confucianism is, let's say, reduced to an extremely minimal function. It matters supremely, that's your whole argument. But its function is to rationalize the empirical mistake that these elites are making uh, by, you know, taking the prior regime collapse too seriously and therefore not taxing the peasants when they could have done so. Okay, so th we want to talk a little bit about this account of what Confucianism was doing and, and what ideology does. So, I mean, the first challenge, again, uh, ig ignorant uh, outsider making it, is that, you know, uh, Taisu uh, claims that there the, that sociologists who took religion extremely seriously, like Max Weber, were Orientalist, racist, and so forth. But but the baby was thrown out with the bathwater, and his goal is to take culture and religion seriously as ideological factors. But it doesn't seem like you take culture and religion that seriously after all. In this following sense. It seems like you believe that humans are rational across space and time, and uh, we might need to tweak a rational actor theory in cases where we just can't get the explanation uh, without some minor foible that humans have induced by culture or religion. Now, this is, this is strange to me because I just assume that people have radically different beliefs and practices across space and time that are bound up with culture, religion, let's call it ideology. And what's, what's interesting about your mind is that you're very reluctant to concede any uh, modification to a basic rational actor theory unless forced to do so. And so, it, this book is about like demanding that scholars of China take culture and religion seriously, but only a tiny bit. But why? Why not say, you know, people didn't always want wealth. Uh, there was no expectation that their state should strive to achieve it. Uh, and that's because of this dominant religion, just like many other places had religions that made them unmodern for all of the, you know, long eras of human history before modernity. Uh, great, okay, so, so this is the conversation that I've been, I've been having with Sam for years about this, about this topic, but it's good to continue it. Um, so two things, bef before I actually get into that, I just want to say just two things in quick response. First, I do think that fixing the state was pretty much in the end all it really took to get China to industrialize, right? Because if you look at the post-Qing history, a lot of, like, none of the other things really got that much better, like property rights, markets, energy supply, this, that, labor prices, whatever. Like, none of those things actually really got better. But the only thing they managed to fix by the 1930s was actually the state became a bit stronger. And right, right there, you get something resembling industrial takeoff in the 1930s. 
Um, the second thing is I never called Weber a racist. Somebody else did. You were citing him. Yeah. Um, like I don't. I don't know whether Weber was racist. I, I don't really care whether Max Weber was racist. Like, he was. I mean, he probably was. Certainly an anti-Semite. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. All right, but okay, so, so like, I, I would care about that as well, but like, whether he's racist towards China or not, I, it's not really one of my core concerns. Um, the, the core posture that Sam talks about is, yes, the book is defensive in the way that it actually gets to ideology, right? You could... There are different ways to bring ideology in. You could do the Weber, the, the, the Weberian thing, and basically say your entire worldview is largely an ideological construct. The way that you think about rationality, the very way you think about your interests, how you pursue those interests, all of those things um, are, are productions of culture and ideology in such a way that if you strip away the culture and ideology, there's really not that much left there. Now, the economists are at the opposite extreme. Right? The economists basically say that everything, as Sam says, transcends time and space. There's, there are core material concerns of human beings. Everybody wants some combination of wealth and perhaps political status. And you combine those two things in various political economy models, and voila, you get universal explanations and, and uh, models that can be applied across time and space and explain every, then th these things explain everything go from the Chinese empire um, to all the way to like modern American politics. Now, as Sam points out, like the, the posture of the book is that let's start by take like let's just say Weber is empirically wrong. Let's take the economist seriously, and then through some pretty um, exhaustive exercises in the first couple of chapters of the book, show why the economist can't be completely right, and then introduce ideology in perhaps by by Sam's taste a relatively limited amount. Um, I, th I guess there are two reasons for this. One is I'm really somewhere in between those two poles. Right? I think there are pr certain portions of human behavior that transcend time and space. I think the general desire for more material wealth is a largely universal thing. Like, you know, well, it can be suppressed, but suppressing it takes enormous amounts of ideological energy, such that it's not such a natural thing to do. It takes like generations of high-level ideological engineering to actually suppress that basic human instinct. So I think there are such things as core human instincts, which again can be suppressed, but in the absence of like high levels of energy done towards um, suppression, they are there pretty much all the time. That said, I think most other, like a lot of other things, including how you strategize, like you have a set of goals that your material core demands give you, but how you get, to, how you pursue them, how you get to those goals, to me is very much ideologically constructed or culturally constructed. So I see a, perhaps a pretty expansive role for all of this stuff. But I also want to distinguish myself from people who would say it's culture all the way down. I, like I see a certain kind of, like, I want to operate on the, on the fault lines between what I perceive to be a, like innately human and what I believe to be culturally constructed. Right? I believe there are inherent desires and I believe there are culturally, cultural, cultural ideological constructs that shape the way that we think and pursue those, those, the, the, those interests, but at the same time also, also, also give us different kinds of interests. There's a certain, like, like those two things produce a certain kind of fault line in the middle. And for me, the most interesting segments of human behavior are, are all on that fault line. It's like trying to disentangle the inherent from the constructed, that frankly gives me the most pleasure. Um, and it's also, I think, the most accurate way to actually depict human behavior, because if you look at like peasantry behavior in the fifth century BC in Egypt, you're gonna find a lot of commonalities with 19th century Russian serfs or 20th century American farmers. Why do certain things seem to transcend? Because it's because I do think there are commonalities. Now that said, there are a huge, as you say, like gigantic variations across space and time, and that's where the cultural and ideological stuff comes in for me. So it may come down to basically just like, we have different priors on how much culture and ideology can explain, and my assumption is I, I'd like to drill down on that until I hit rock bottom, and rock bottom basically is the economic rationalism that I think is a little bit in all of us. So whether we believe that there is that kind of rock bottom core, I think is the main difference between the two of us. And perhaps also the, the, the difference between me and both economists and I guess anthropologists and sociologists. Sounds good. I mean, I'm the Weberian then because you know the historical Weber believed that economic rationality had to be historically and socially constituted yes. Yes. and it was not just a given 
uh, and his whole project was, yes, was this, studying yeah. its emergence. So this I'm, is the first time I've ever heard you say you're the Weberian. So I, like, I count that as a personal victory. But I, I, I'd also say that I'm a Weberian in the sense that I believe in paradigms. Right. I believe in ideal types. I believe in paradigms. I, I, I think that's the right way to think. It's just the content of that, uh, that ideal type is a little bit, it's somewhat different than Weber's. So, yeah. so I want to ask a final question to leave you know, time for others, which is, is really about the last couple of paragraphs of the book. Because maybe they suggest that this book is not the proper occasion to settle any dispute about culture. Because your own account of uh, Con Confucian ideology in this period yeah. is is in a sense that it's the last gasp of Confucianism. And that, um, I mean, you put this very beautifully in, in the last page or two, where you suggest that it, 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 it's as if elites, by reducing Confucianism just to this, you know, uh, this rationalization of, of, of a mistake they're making, while allowing a kind of virtue to die and wealth yes. to be considered a criterion of their own success, they set themselves up for their own falls. Uh, because eventually it, it wasn't just that they failed to become wealthy, but uh, they became poor and uh, they were judged and removed for this reason. Uh, and this, this is quite interesting because you could read it in different ways. Um, of course, you know, forward, it, it leads Chinese to just accept wealth and power, naked, its naked pursuit as the way of, of their world in the future. But of course, you could read your, your conclusion as suggesting that uh, virtue should have been restored uh, and it should the the real error in the thing was was letting it get reduced to just this rationalization of a failure to adequately pursue China's ascendancy, uh, as of course its current rulers are still doing. Yes, great. Like so, so uh, you, I think that's exactly right. Um, now I am a good Confucian man, or at least I try to be a good Confucian man. Uh, I'm a, I'm a member of like not just like a dying breed. I think like it's a, it's pretty much a dead breed. Um, but so yeah, for those of us who still have a certain kind of fondness for various facets of Confucianism, not necessarily the misogyny or the racism or whatever, um, but those of us who believe in certain kinds of filial piety as virtue and so on and so forth, yeah, I mean, the failure of, I think, the, the entire Qing regime was not just in its failure to industrialize or to keep China on par with Japan and its ability to wage war or produce economic growth. The, the even deeper failure for us is it actually turned exactly as you say, it turned Confucianism from a, essentially a, a, an ideology of virtue, a worldview that was largely based on morality and self-perceptions of virtue and, and values into kind of like an economically or materially pragmatic Worldview, and this was also done in the aftermath of the Ming collapse. They thought the main problem, like one of the other, the other main problem with the, the Ming elites, were that they were too moralists, right? So, if we're going to define ourselves against them, then we have to become less moralist. We have to become more pragmatic. But exactly as you say, the minute you become more pragmatic, and you begin to de you, be you begin defining your own uh, success and failure on a material basis, then it becomes possible to quote unquote like materially falsify the entire freaking ideology, right? It's something that never actually happens to like Shinto religion or a certain kind of Hinduism in either Japan or India. Like right? other Asian countries, or certainly not in the Islamic world, other Asian countries survive the onslaught of Western imperialism, more or less, not quite more, entirely, but with some chunk of their belief and their, more, their, their cultural traditions intact, because those cultural tradi traditions can't be falsified on material grounds. They're fundamentally about like metaphysical, ways to see the world and morality and ethics and so on and so forth. And that's not falsifiable just by a demonstration of like Western material superiority. The problem with Qing Confucianism was that it, be, it, it became so enthralled with defining success and failure of regimes, of beliefs, based on their material outcomes, that the demonstration of material superiority by the West was a much deeper blow to the Chinese elite psyche than I think it was for either the Japanese one or the Indian one or the Ottoman one or, or, so, or, or so on and so forth. I mean, not to say that those blows weren't deep, 
But those countries didn't just fundamentally reject their traditional paradigms and just say, we're just, we're just going to westernize all the way through. So I think that's right. Um, I think it's like many Chinese would probably say that's probably darn, that's pretty darn good because it allows us to cast off the shackles of traditional culture and thoroughly modernize. And so like that's one, perhaps one reason why we've been able to grow so fast in the past 40 years. I see it as more of a tragedy because I don't think that you have to cast away your traditional cultures quite so thoroughly for you to have modernized economic growth. Plus, traditional culture is a malleable thing. Confucianism is a capacious thing that allows for all kinds of modern, like modernizing reforms. I think you can easily have you know, gender equality and things like that within the overall realms of Confucianism. But that's just me. So I may be like, just hanging on to like, a misguided belief in the past. So.